This section is going to be on Marxism and anarchism uh, as two radical left uh, oppositions to uh, 19th century developments that center around enlightenment ideals uh, and technology with the Industrial Revolution uh, and free market practices. Uh, but they're mostly going to attack individualism uh, in that the Enlightenment sort of focused on individuals using reason and acquiring knowledge uh, and seeing humans universally and acting as individual agents and trying to form these social contracts that would uh, allow people to operate with maximal uh, freedom and liberty, uh, but also protect those liberties from um, you know, uh, imposing by other states or their own state or other people in those states. Um, so what I need to do really quickly is kind of explain this, and this will probably help a lot of you out for the, for the future, uh, what the political spectrum looks like itself, as we know it today anyway. And uh, it's going to largely start developing <clears throat> in this modern era, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, during slash after the Enlightenment. Because <clears throat> even in the Enlightenment, you had several prominent anti-Enlightenment thinkers that uh, incepted several ideas that developed into what are now um, you know, various portions of, particularly at the extremes, uh, the political spectrum. Uh, the two you could probably point to most obviously uh, were uh, the Frenchman uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, as well as um, uh, Immanuel Kant uh, from Germany, uh, Prussia specifically, I believe. Uh, those two guys are going to drive this counter-enlightenment um, uh, narrative. And although, although Kant's more of a hybrid, uh, he certainly is going to call into question reason, reason individuality in favor of, of faith uh, and metaphysical uh, concepts that can't be proven by uh, uh, reason and observation and testing, uh, or not necessarily anyway. And then uh, Rousseau is going to definitely be anti-enlightenment, almost across the board. Uh, the only real thing he's going to actually ad uh, adhere to that's enlightenment uh, inspired, not the only thing, but... Uh, one of the most obvious is his idea of a social contract, but it's not going to be centered on the individual. It's going to be centered on, because most social, social contracts protect the individual from the uh, uh, persecution of the government or another government or other individuals uh, while trying to allow you to do the most you can on your own in your own self-interest. Uh, he's going to take an opposite view in that they'll still have a social contract and a government, uh, but they're not enforcing protection of the individual. They're enforcing protection of the collective uh, of like the uh, uh, collection of individuals that are actually not individuals but form some sort of like social super organism uh, and anyone that's going against that uh, the 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 well-being of that that group that super organism of people uh, should be disposed of uh, so it's a very radical uh, uh, counter enlightenment based uh, set of ideals uh, and we're not going in depth uh, on on Kant at all actually we're just going to focus on Rousseau but I just want you to understand there's a lot more to Rousseau than what we're gonna talk about. Uh, but essentially, you could kind of sum up a lot of his views as rejecting uh, conscious reason uh, and thought and even technology in favor of knowing what is true based on your intuition and how you feel, which are absolutely the seeds of the Romantic movement, uh, which are uh, prominent in this 19th century, uh, as well as his rejection of individualism in favor of collectivism, which is again, not viewing people as individuals who have their own opinions and ideas and abilities and should be protected, but seeing people as this collective group uh, that's kind of like a super organism that is much more important than the individuals that comprise it. Kind of like, I guess this kind of works. It's kind of like how you actually are just a, a billions of cells put together and you kind of ignore the existence or role of an individual cell in favor of uh, the collective. So that like, for example, if you develop cancer, uh, you don't care about the cancer cells, which are still a part of your body. Uh, you actually eradicate those cancerous cells to protect uh, the collective, which is the rest of you. That's kind of how Rousseau viewed things. That's oversimplifying, but that kind of gives you an idea. So uh, let's look at this uh, political spectrum as it develops across the 19th century into today. So you've got uh, a spectrum here, and you've got, from your perspective anyway, sorry if I actually flipped this, but I'm going to use your perspective. For you, this would be the right, and this would be the left. So you have uh, the right wing, right wing. By the way, this terminology actually itself comes from the uh, French Revolution, uh, depending on where conservatives or, or liberals and radicals sat. Uh, we got the right wing, and we got the uh, left wing. All right, and in the center, we have what you would call a, a, a more moderate position. Now, we, we do call it a spectrum because you can't just lump somebody perfectly uh, in like these, these set quantized uh, uh, locations, 
you're going to kind of have some views of one or the other. Uh, but more people that are towards the center, whether they're moderate right wing or moderate left wing or just a pure moderate, an ace, a political moderate, uh, mostly these sorts of uh, people tend to be more individualistic. Whether they favor uh, uh, right wing theory slightly more, or left wing theory slightly more, they are they're more concerned with um, people's uh, how can I phrase this individual freedom and uh, social contract protection of that protecting of that individual freedom. Um, so this is what you would call uh, what, we'll, what, we've, what we've already talked about previously, uh, or in another video anyway, uh, is about classical liberalism. So protecting that individual against uh, others and allowing that individual to blossom. Uh, so here you would put ideas based on John Locke, uh, based on most Enlightenment thinkers, including Voltaire, uh, to some degree certainly, and, and most Enlightenment thought sort of centers people uh, around here, usually a little bit more toward the left, uh, on moderate left, but you can still certainly have some very pro-enlightenment liberal, uh, uh, classical liberal thinkers that are along the right uh, side, especially the economic stuff about free trade. So that's kind of how people clump in the center. And on the uh, edges, as you go further away and you get more towards the end here, which is considered the radical or far left, slash far left, and the same thing on the right, the uh, radical slash far right, Uh, these are, generally speaking, very counter-enlightenment, both of them. So at the very end of the spectrum, we have counter-enlightenment, counter-enlightenment. And again, generally, towards the closer you get to the center, the more classical liberal people tend to get. Uh, and again, a little more emphasis on economic freedom and a little more emphasis on individual freedom uh, for the left and the right as you get closer. But these are individualistic, and you would say, generally speaking, pro-enlightenment. Um, and the reason why these two ends here, which are going to be actually very similar but have different nuanced explanations, uh, they're both going to be driven by, uh, roughly speaking, uh, Rousseau. Now, whether you have people that are more religious here or nationalistic, uh, it's still going to be a, a, you could say anyway, comparing to other Enlightenment ideals uh, and adopting views that Rousseau has influenced them because they, again, hold more important uh, a collective identity, whatever it might be. So, for the far right, uh, and again, we have the, the seeds of this are here in Rousseau. We have, and we're going to say here, collectivist. Uh, because if you remember from our, our discussion on the Enlightenment and the Counter Enlightenment, uh, Rousseau is much more focused on the general will. He cares a lot more about that super organism of people than the individuals in it. Um, so if any are, are contradicting what the, the general will, that super organism of people wants, uh, they're out. And I don't mean just like go away or put you in prison. Like he actually uh, believed that if you opposed the beliefs of their uh, either religious or social uh, general will, that you should actually be eradicated. Uh, so he's, he's rather extreme. So as we find on the extreme here, we have very, very extreme views. Uh, and what I mean is collective views, views that don't see people as uh, these uh, individual agents that are capable of learning and doing things and having unique perspectives, but they see people as belonging to specific groups. And the thing that's of primary importance to people on the far right, uh, sorry, on the far right and, and the far left, uh, are going to be those collective group identities, not the individuals in them. So on the far right here, you're going to have, I'm not going to go too depth, in depth into this, I just want to establish this. You have um, the uh, Strictly very religious in many cases, many cases, but I want to point out you can absolutely have uh, people who are still personally religious uh, that can come close to this moderate. Because uh, one of the enlightened views, of course, is sure have your religion, but just don't impose it on anybody else. Uh, so if you're somebody who is, um, you know, Muslim or Christian or Buddhist or whatever, uh, and you feel that the religion you follow is the right one and others can choose what they want and, you, and, and be tolerant of it, then you would definitely be religious but still be more towards the center as a, as a pro-enlightenment. However, for those that believe my religion is the correct answer uh, and all of the other ones are wrong and what we need to do is protect this religion and spread it at the expense of other religions, perhaps violently uh, or perhaps even peacefully, but in fact to spread it uh, and get rid of them as, as enemies, as competitors, then that would be more towards the uh, far right. So those are where you would find um, 
any Christian radicals. There really aren't many now, but certainly in the past there were like the Catholic Church when it was attempting to eradicate um, Jews and uh, Muslims uh, and uh, Protestants uh, in medieval Europe. That would absolutely be a case of a far-right collective identity that was religious. So you can have um, collective, uh, collective religious adherence. Uh, probably the best example nowadays, and again, don't, don't mischaracterize uh, what I'm saying as saying all Muslims are like this, because it is a very small minority of Muslims. But for the few Muslim uh, um, uh, terrorists or extremists, I guess is a better word, that often practice terrorism, uh, they would be lumped in here because they believe that their form or their state, whether it's you know recreating the old caliphates like they're tr they were trying to do with ISIS or, or whatever it might be, uh, that others are wrong and dead wrong to the point that they should join us or die. Uh, that would be an example. And again, they're rare and don't think that characterizes uh, the majority of Muslims because it doesn't. Uh, but nonetheless, some do exist and those are the ones that are the uh, most uh, uh, prominently shown uh, in um, broadcast news, uh, at least since the um, uh, late night, or the 1990s and early 2000s and 9-11. So that could be considered, but that's not really as popular nowadays. That's a little more of a historical view, but you can definitely have Christian fundamentalists that are in this, this, this block, or Muslim extremists, whoever it might be. Uh, the one that's going to be much more popular in the 19th century, uh, as nationalism gained more momentum, and again, a lot of that's going to be linked here uh, to Rousseau, uh, and then followers uh, of Rousseau or his ideals which is to a lesser degree, he doesn't copy him exactly, but Immanuel Kant uh, does adopt some of the uh, perspective of Rousseau uh, and those that were influenced by Kant, like uh, Johann Fichte uh, going forward into the 19th century, the very pro-nationalist German, uh, they're gonna be very much inspired indirectly uh, and directly by Rousseau. But you have here what we call <clears throat> the National Socialists. And when we say socialist, we mean using the government as a mechanism for protecting whatever you see as the collective superorganism. In the case of national socialists, your nation uh, is going to be that superorganism collective that needs to be protected at all costs. Uh, so generally those are going to be uh, ethnocentric nation states, right? So uh, Germany and the German Empire, right? All, all of the things you know about Hitler were driven by this national socialist, socialist ideology that Germans are the uh, superior race. They're the super organism that needs to be protected. Uh, anyone who gets in the way of that, whether they're an inferior group or they're somebody inside of the German empire that is German that's, that's going against it, that's pro-enlightenment or pro-democracy or something like that, they need to be uh, gotten rid of uh, and disposed of as political enemies. So uh, here you can characterize this as fascism, as most people have, uh, but those are national socialists. And uh, notice the term use of the word socialist because that is the case. They do use the state uh, to uh, pursue this goal. So the state generally has uh, very tight or complete control of the economy. Uh, in the case of the Nazis, they worked hand in hand with the major uh, uh, corporations. Some people call it a fascist, fascist corporate uh, merger or, or, or uh, uh, codependency or, or cooperation. Uh, and whether you're Mussolini or Francisco Franco or you're Adolf Hitler, uh, you, your program is, is based on protecting your nation uh, at the expense of others, and often also meaning, especially for Italy and Germany, expanding at the expense of others, because your race, your ethnicity, your nation is the most important thing. All others are potential rivals, and they need to be uh, uh, exterminated or, or, or subjugated in some way uh, to promote the, the collective, right? The German race or the Italian nation or whatever. So uh, nationalism, as driven into the 19th century, very, very, very much um, uh, in line with, on the extreme end, as it goes further down the spectrum, towards national socialism. And we will see that come to fruition, like we mentioned in the early 20th century with the fascist movements there. All right, so that's kind of the two extremes. And again, these guys are very much anti-enlightenment. Now they might uh, believe in, in science and technology, which they do, and, and so do, by the way, classical Marxists, which we're gonna talk about here. Um, but they are very much opposed to the individualism uh, component of Enlightenment thought. Uh, and again, the, the objective is to protect the uh, superorganism, whatever it is, whether it's your nation state or whether it's uh, uh, a particular class, that, uh, that needs to be protected at all costs. It does not take into account individual people, only the uh, collective group. So on the left, we have here, um, certainly today it looks a bit different, but we start with, mostly speaking, 
Uh, utopian socialists, they don't last that long. They're not all that su successful. But we talked about them briefly. Uh, Robert Owens, um, uh, uh, Fouillet, uh, saint Simon. those uh, gentlemen kind of represent that uh, attempt at creating a, an industrial society that still has factories and technology, but uh, is, is more focused on the well-being and sharing of spoils of production uh, amongst people equally. Uh, so that's going to be kind of the beginning there. Uh, and you can even lump in anarchists. There wasn't really any codified anarchist thought, though, until, um, crap, what was his name? He was an Englishman. Godwin? I might have the name wrong. I'll, 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 I'll look it up after I publish this video or edit the video and put the name in. Uh, but an Englishman actually sort of detailed what the first actual anarchist ideals were. Uh, certainly by, by the time uh, Mikhail Bakunin, who we'll talk about later in this uh, talk, comes along, uh, anarchism is going to be seen as its own ideology. But you can definitely lump in anarchists here, uh, and we'll talk about why. Because anarchists are... Um, the thing that separates them from the National Socialists or Classical Marxists or Utopian Socialists is they're actually opposed to having any government at all or any state form that forces you to be a part of it. So we'll, we'll talk about the differences, but they're definitely over here on this uh, collective socialist uh, uh, humanitarian um, approach. So the, basically this side picks a specific type of human or, or people that it thinks are superior and wants to protect at the expense of others. This one pick, picks either humans overall or a specific class of humans that they see as um, not attempting to coercively control or exploit others. All right, and here's the one that becomes more popular because neither one of these becomes particularly um, relevant or, or, or organized or, well, relevant was a good word. Uh, classical Marxists are gonna be the ones that we are gonna talk about next. Classical Marxists, of course, um, are opposed to individual thought. Marx himself wasn't necessarily. He definitely believed in science. He wasn't part of the anti-science uh, portion of Rousseau. He still considered, his ideas were considered by himself and Engels uh, social, scientific socialism. So they still want to incorporate technology, still want to benefit humans at the expense of the environment and others. But they did not want humans coercing or stealing from or exploiting any other humans. And they thought that um, historically, uh, ever since we <clears throat> figure out how to use technology uh, and, and, and farm and use agriculture, that humans had increasingly exploited or exercised power and control over another. Usually an oppressing class was, was uh, using its power to control or exploit uh, the oppressed classes. So we'll get into detail what he means by that, but uh, who they see as the collective are, are the humans that are or had been traditionally exploited. So what they want to do is protect that group, right? In, in the case of the 19th century, it would be the working class. Uh, they want to protect that group and eliminate or dissolve or chase out or eradicate the, uh, the exploiting class, the one that was doing the exploiting, uh, which would be in the case of the 19th century, the middle class. So uh, their collectivist ideal was centered around um, protecting that exploited group, in this case the working class, uh, at the expense of the middle class. Uh, and they'll have a whole bunch of explanations for why they think that is the case. Uh, I won't say Marxism though, and Marx himself was entirely uh, a collectivist. I think by majority he wouldn't be, but he still believed in, you know, each individual doing what they wanted to do. He actually believed that forming this would make people more free and productive, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Um, so you can't quite lump them into like a, as extreme of a view as Hitler, for example, or later the, um, the ones who sort of adjust or tweak uh, Marxism uh, to, to, to carry it out in the 20th century, like Lenin and, and Stalin and Mao. Uh, but um, uh, he definitely did believe in, in viewing the world through a lens of preventing groups from being exploited by other groups. So that would be inherently collective. Uh, that's going to fail, and we'll talk about why. And then he would sort of move on to, um, how do I phrase this, uh, Leninist Marxists uh, or Maoist Marxists. But now we're getting into like different definitions where uh, they actually believe you should use elite force rather than the class itself to help the, the class out. So we'll talk about that. But any form of Marxist uh, or anarchist or socialist that isn't a national socialist, uh, you would actually lump onto this side. Because again, 
they argue in favor of the collective, uh, but they, they pick different groups. So these guys pick a particular religion or a particular race or, or ethnicity oftentimes, and then these guys choose a particular class or group that they feel is being oppressed by others uh, as, as one to uh, extricate or protect. Uh, and in both cases, both sides to varying degrees are willing to, obviously the most violent being the Leninist and Maoists and National Socialists, uh, but anarchists and, other, and, and Marxists and socialists and uh, religious, uh, radical religious adherents are all um, in favor of using violent force to achieve their objectives. So whether it's protecting their religion, their ethnic group or nation, or uh, you know, whichever class of people are, or humanity itself from being exploited, they are perfectly willing to uh, use violent force to achieve that means. They don't care about the individuals that stand in the way, generally speaking. Uh, and again, to varying degrees of, of violence and willingness to use violence, but they generally don't care about who's in the way. Uh, if you stand in their way of what they see as anything that's opposing or, 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 or impeding their, uh, the protection or expansion of their superorganism, whether it's uh, the superorganism of people in a religion, the superorganism of people in a nation, or the superorganism of class, that uh, you deserve to be removed. Whether that's imprisoned or exiled or killed uh, depends on the particular time and the particular person, the particular circumstance, but nonetheless, they're willing to use that. So uh, in all cases, uh, violence is a often a necessary or at least uh, optim possible means, necessary means of uh, achieving, of effecting change. And that applies to both. So that's here uh, as well as here uh, too. So don't think I'm only applying to the left. Both are characterized by that. So when we talk about these themes uh, in the 20th century when the uh, uh, Marxist regimes uh, come to fruition and the National Socialist regimes come to fruition, uh, we'll see, you'll, you'll perhaps be less appalled, oh I shouldn't say less appalled, but less surprised that they're willing to uh, uh, kill these, uh, I believe the total, uh, killed of their own people in their own borders for uh, fascists during the 20th century was about 18 million. That's including the Holocaust, obviously. Uh, and I believe the total for the fasc or the uh, um, Marxist regimes attempting to pursue their objectives uh, totaled around 110 million. Uh, and that's because they were, um, they took place in higher population areas like China, for example. They were pretty much half of that total alone. Um, but also it was less obvious that it was evil or wrong to, to most people because here they're saying our race is superior, yours sucks, get out of the way. It's easy to not label that as bad. It's harder to label this as wrong, at least the way they're pursuing it, uh, by saying, oh, we want to help out this group, so we'll get rid of the, the, the oppressing group. So more people are willing to um, shrug off any potential uh, collateral damage. Uh, but when you see these things in practice and once these regimes have ended and uh, information gets out about what they did, uh, and they find out that it's not just U.S. propaganda reporting all the, the casualties for these uh, regimes, that uh, it becomes clear just how deadly and devastating that they are. So um, be shocked by the uh, numbers and, and, and think that's appropriate, but uh, perhaps now you'd be less surprised because the way that these guys see the world is here's our goal. It's for the collective, generally speaking, uh, and anyone who gets in the way is just an obstacle that needs to be um, exiled, imprisoned, eliminated, whatever it might be. <clears throat> so now that we understand that, let's talk about Marxism itself. And uh, perhaps now you'll have a better idea as to how these um, incredibly violent regimes can uh, start their development in the 19th century. And then of course, come into existence in the uh, very, very violent first half of the 20th century. Marxism, that is going to be an ideology that comes out of the 19th century. Uh, it's not gonna be as popular or important, I guess you could say, when it initially comes out, but certainly by the late 19th century, because it comes out about the mid-19th mid century, by the late 19th, early 20th century, it's going to be very um, prominent and important, and in fact, it's going to usher in a, uh, a host of, of um, communist regimes in the 20th century that will unfortunately lead to the uh, uh, suffering and death of, of tens of millions. Um, so we'll talk about what his ideas were, because uh, he's a big critic of capitalism, uh, of private property, and uh, to some degree you could say individualism, but certainly the, for, you know, the former too. So <clears throat> Marx, uh, Karl Marx himself, a uh, philosopher uh, in the uh, 18th, uh, 19th century, sorry, 
Uh, and he also paired himself with a, a co-author and a person that funded his works because Marx's works, of course, made him uh, rather unpopular in his home states because he pretty much opposed the policies of his own states uh, and wanted to help facilitate worker revolutions uh, or reform. Uh, so Marx uh, did eventually go into exile and, and did most of his work uh, from London, and um, even though he's German. And he's going to uh, be financed and helped uh, and co-author several works, uh, including the, the Communist Manifesto and later his uh, volumes uh, called Das Kapital, or, or, or Capital. Uh, and that's going to be Friedrich Engels that's going to uh, help him accomplish that who was the uh, son of a wealthy, uh, I believe his father owned cotton, some sort of textile miller factory uh, in Germany and England. I might be wrong about that, but nonetheless, he was the son of a capitalist who funded, ironically, uh, the production of uh, communist ideals. So Karl Marx, he is going to be, uh, whether you agree with him or not, you have to give him credit or credit is due. He is one of the um, very skeptical and innovative thinkers of the 19th century. Uh, people lump him in along with Nietzsche and Freud as these sort of, <clears throat> how do you phrase it, trailblazing, um, uh, thought-provoking individuals who uh, drastically change the philosophical, economic, and political landscape uh, with their ideas. So the reason why Marx does this is he's going to come out uh, opposing capitalism uh, and the capitalist system as well as the concepts of, of private property, uh, and like I said, to a lesser extent, individualism. Uh, but here is what, um, generally speaking, the development and theories of Marxism were. And again, he did co-author a lot of these, uh, and uh, his publications were, were funded by Friedrich Engels, who also participated in it. So uh, Marx is what you would call um, a, you could use either term, I suppose, uh, a historical materialist, Uh, or uh, you could say he was an adherent or developer of what we, what's called uh, dialectical materialism. Uh, and uh, that probably is completely unclear to you as to what it means. Uh, the best way I could sum it up is he argues that um, our social systems and settings and ideas uh, don't come from our heads and go out into the world but it's actually sort of the reverse. They're a response to the world that we, we are in. So the, the, the economic and social conditions, well, I'd actually, I just say the economic conditions, the economic conditions of our existence, because that's what Marx feels is the primary base, most important factor in, in human society and ideas. Uh, materialists see the, that as the base, the starting point. So we are given a, a situation or come into an environment uh, that has uh, a various social system based on the economic availability of goods. Uh, and that is what dictates um, and forms or shapes our ideas about how we set society up and how we justify that. Uh, and those are used to maintain um, the, I guess say, the vestiges of power that, are, that already exist in our societies. Um, so he is um, one that takes a similar, but um, I guess you'd say ideologically opposite view of a, um, a German philosopher that preceded um, Hegel. Hegel, uh, was the one who sort of developed this dialectic method. Uh, so Hegelian uh, dialectics, I'm probably confusing you already, but just, just let it develop for a second here. Uh, this is why it's important to understand, I think anyway, uh, where Marx's ideas come from, uh, because he was influenced by this guy. Uh, so he was a German philosopher, and he is going to develop the uh, uh, idealistic uh, dialectical method. Uh, and the difference between him and Marx fundamentally is he's focused on uh, the formation of ideas, uh, and Marx is focused on the uh, uh, real material world as far as its influence on our ideas. Real uh, material world. I should actually put that down here where the terms are. Okay, and that's going to focus on the real material uh, world. So he thinks the base is our material world, and then our ideas and structures come from that, and then Hegel thinks it's kind of the opposite. So I think Marx's own words where he, he takes Hegel's ideas and flips them uh, upside down, but they're still Hegel's ideas. So Hegel, what he believed was, historically, <clears throat> philosophers had been kind of doing it wrong, uh, the way they've been thinking about things. He believed that, uh, historically, just because something is proven wrong, like an idea, for example, like, let's take Descartes' uh, example about how he believed um, uh, 
our behavior was driven by these like animal spirits, these like how these like fluids flew uh, flow through our body and brain, and that de determined our behavior. Um, was he wrong? Yes, uh, but was he kind of right? You could say kind of because he definitely is. Uh, that idea is kind of linked to our neural system and how it works through electrochemicals and the release of neurotransmitters. Um, so he's indirectly but partially right. So it's easy to, to show that Descartes is wrong, but uh, there was an element of truth in what he said. Uh, so what Hegel believed was that uh, there was um, a thesis, basically. So uh, you'd make a, you'd have an idea, you'd be like, I think this is how the world works, or I think this is how existence or knowledge works or what, what to exist means and, and, and all of that. Uh, you have this idea, and then once somebody comes up along with an idea that proves you wrong, um, Hegel said that the previous interpretation by philosophers that was wrong was to think that now their idea was dead. Hegel says no, just because someone contradicts you or proves you're wrong, whatever it might be, uh, that doesn't mean that um, your idea or your uh, being is incorrect, that's just part of his existence is uh, evolving by contradicting itself. That probably didn't help you either, but maybe my analogy will, will uh, help you out. So he believed there were ideas, and then people would, or maybe even yourself, would propose uh, a contradiction that, sort of proving that it was wrong. And Hegel said, before that, would, people would just drop it and say, oh, that idea is dead and done, we need a new one. Uh, he's like, no, this is actually part of like an evolutionary process. So you have an idea, then somebody, uh, or even yourself, contradicts that idea, that's called the antithesis, antithesis, I guess you could say, but I've always heard of it as antithesis, but antithesis, if it helps you uh, understand. So that's the thing, the idea existing, and this is the opposite of its idea or, or its negative version that contradicts it. So usually that would be, you have an idea, someone comes up with a contradiction, and now it doesn't exist anymore. Wham, that was how he saw it. But Hegel says, no, 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 you're, you're doing it wrong. Uh, this is actually a complete process that leads to uh, uh, better ideas. And not, it's not a new idea either. It was actually born out of the old idea. So you needed this process of coming up with one version, contradicting it, and then that is going to create a brand new, evolved, better, improved version uh, that is what's called the synthesis. Uh, and uh, the best analogy, not the best, but one of the better or simpler ones is um, that you can give is uh, a seed. So you, you got a seed here, you plant it in the ground, and you need things like sunlight, nutrients in the soil, water for it to grow. Um, but if that seed within itself <clears throat> doesn't contain the DNA and design for its own death, uh, then nothing's going to happen. Let's say we take a seed that is actually dead inside, uh, that the, the cells have, have perished, like, I don't know, like you go buy sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds, those things are dried out and actually dead. Um, each seed within itself contains its own destruction. So if the seed is the idea, or the thesis, within itself is actually uh, its contradiction, or its um, um, anti-being, I guess you could say. Uh, it's a contradiction. And uh, it does have to wait for ideal scenarios, like you need the sunlight, you need the uh, material, uh, the nutrients in the soil, you need the water. But even if you had those things, if the seed inside of itself doesn't uh, contain the plans for its own later growth, uh, it's not going to ever evolve. So just because somebody, so this is the idea, someone comes up with a contradiction that sort of proves it wrong, all that does is transform it uh, to allow for a uh, a, a, a new uh, emergen, uh, emergence of, of this idea. So this seed, of course, if it has its inner contradiction, uh, the development or the possibility for its own destruction, uh, for an actual plant to grow, this seed in its current form has to destroy itself and, and begin to sprout uh, the actual plant. And in the process, uh, the seed is gonna be destroyed, of course, eventually it's you know, turned to roots and the seed's actually gone. Uh, but that would be the uh, synthesis. Uh, and he says that, no, 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 the old idea isn't gone and void forever. This isn't a new idea. This was there the whole time. The plans, in, in this case, in the DNA and the seed, were there the entire time. Uh, and you needed to um, contradict it to allow it to break and blossom and form. So what he argues is that history isn't just a sequence of bad ideas that have been refuted and new ideas appear. Uh, he actually sees that as a necessary process, that you need to have ideas, you need to contradict those ideas because those uh, allow the actual 
correct or best idea to, to, uh, to form or actualize, all right? So, maybe that didn't help you out, or maybe it did, but try to think of it like this. If you have an idea, you contradict it, um, you're still gonna be basing your next idea on those previous ideas, so they're not gone. They didn't disappear, uh, you just allowed them uh, to actualize, uh, and their existence and contradictions uh, coincide to produce uh, or lead you to a, a, a better or more correct version of that idea. So it's been there the whole time. Uh, so that's kind of what this dialectical method is. It's like don't disregard the past ideas and methods. They're not like trash to be disposed of. Uh, they actually, within themselves, contained what we got to now and what's going to become the perfect answer uh, down the road or a close approximation of that. So how did Marx uh, take this? So he flipped it. He, instead of focusing ideas, he focused on uh, the real world and how it generated ideas. So uh, the historical materialism portion of Marx, uh, Marx's ideology is that it's going to use this a similar formula uh, in that it's going to, instead of focusing on ideas, focus on the material world. So he's going to see this as uh, past material uh, circumstances um, are actually going to uh, uh, drive and shape our social uh, organizations, our institutions, and ideas. Uh, and he sees it as a historical process, uh, one that is similar to this, in that we come up with a new way to structure society uh, through the use of technology and the availability of resources, uh, and then we uh, eventually, within that system that we created, exists also the future of its own uh, demise and contradiction to blossom into something that is uh, a new or improved version of that. So the way he thought of that was the first sort of stage, uh, the first situation that shaped our, our, our social organization, our ideas, was what he called uh, primitive communism. In this stage, which uh, he likely saw as more ideal than not ideal, uh, this is where we didn't really have technology. This is kind of like the Paleolithic era of our existence where we had just basic stone tools uh, and we, humans basically wandered around hunting and gathering, uh, perhaps practicing some sort of uh, lightweight horticultural gardening. But for the most part, nomadic hunter-gatherers, uh, where hunter-gatherer societies uh, had very, very, very undeveloped technology Uh, and were relatively <clears throat> egalitarian, meaning there was equality. So you might go back in time and find that they had less stuff <clears throat> and life might have been more dangerous perhaps, but people had the same amount of stuff in that uh, uh, if I was a member of a tribe and you were a member of a tribe, we probably had the same amount of things. Uh, we'd have our basic clothes, <clears throat> maybe our basic weapons for hunting or, or, or foraging, and then we'd have uh, the materials we use to, to form our shelter, and we all pretty much just have what we can carry and move around. So he believed that it was relatively equal. Now that's not entirely accurate. We should note that um, maybe in respect to material goods, it might've been more egalitarian, but there certainly was not equality of treatment uh, because we do actually have hierarchical uh, uh, structures even in these hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, which we'll which we'll talk about later, but just keep that in mind that even though maybe the <clears throat> material wealth was relatively equal in these previous societies, and, and Marx had no way of knowing this, um, there was still um, a very unequal hierarchy uh, as far as decision making uh, and access to things like um, uh, first of all where they're going to go, uh, how they're going to do things, uh, as well as uh, access to uh, reproduction. Uh, so, for example. <clears throat> more successful or, or, or violent individuals were more likely to uh, have more children, uh, which of course uh, gave them more access to reproduction, which is certainly a form of, of inequality. <clears throat> but nonetheless, uh, he thought that primitive communism was sort of this first stage and uh, things were going well-ish uh, and things started going wrong uh, with the formation of a new idea, uh, which was private property. This is gonna occur sort of when we have what's called the Neolithic Revolution. And this is where we figure out how to use domesticated animals and use agriculture to uh, uh, actually make more food than we need. And <clears throat> generally speaking, 
although there is some exception with pastoral communities, uh, we're largely going to be settled in, in one location, have permanent settlements instead of being nomadic. So here's where you kind of see things going wrong. Uh, this is where society develops. Develops. Uh, and the, um, the new way that they're uh, going to transition is going to be uh, this egalitarian approach is going to be traded off or contradicted by a, a, the arrival of what are now called surpluses. So because they make more food than they need individually, they now are able to have more things per person. And some people are going to very quickly uh, have more of those things than others. So let's say, for example, the more uh, successful farmers have more food, so they can uh, use that food surplus to, uh, to pay other people in food, to uh, farm for them, or protect their surplus as soldiers or build walls or whatever. So we have the first beginnings of what he sees as inequality. Uh, society develops uh, based on surplus, and material inequality uh, begins in the form of private ownership. So again, because uh, some people have more than others, uh, they're able to um, claim that it is theirs, which according to Marx wasn't previously a, a dominant view or, or characteristic of society in this era. And you could certainly argue that it was, but nonetheless, uh, according to Marx, it was not. And uh, this um, was the beginnings of what uh, he saw as far as materialistically, the real world material goods available, uh, the beginning of, of disparity uh, in uh, material goods and power and social status. So this is going to, of course, uh, favor some over others. And uh, that's going to, of course, uh, lead to inequality. and uh, the forming of society. Uh, now what he thinks is going to be occurring here is they're going to form these new ideas uh, based on their material availability. So what he's gonna say is the people that have the stuff want to maintain that system, so they're going to uh, create a social order, whether it's a religion or a state system, that enforces that, that says, this is my property, you can't take it, and if you do take it, there's a punishment for that. So uh, leads to inequality and establishes uh, the first social uh, structures that enforce specific classes uh, and power. So this is the beginning of uh, where Marx sees it as going at least more wrong. Um, he's not opposed to technology, which we'll, we'll talk about because his views are considered scientific socialism, according to him. But he does see this as the, the um, unfortunate turning point for humanity, according to him, where uh, we see actual disparity in power between individuals. Whereas before it was more egalitarian with regards to material uh, wealth or access, now we have individuals gaining more than others. So the reason why this fits into his dialectic system as we go down is you're going to see here that uh, with new, uh, each new idea, is going to contain within it the seeds of its own destruction uh, or, or its, its opposite or its contradiction. Uh, so what's going to eventually happen here, and, and, and Marx is a big fan of this, is people would get so upset that certain people have so much and then they have so little in comparison uh, that they would actually begin to suffer and eventually they would rise up and um, uh, act out uh, in, in rebellion against this, uh, I guess you'd say, social system based on private property. Uh, and they would evolve. So <clears throat> as time went on, uh, more and more individuals obtain these uh, structures, uh, or the, these, um, uh, what am I looking for, what for? Maintain these surpluses and uh, acquired more and more private property. Uh, and you go through the classical empires, we'll jump ahead here to the uh, feudal uh, class system. So this is where uh, the the, I guess you would say, historical uh, uh, development that is just before industrialism, where you have a, a similar version of this. Uh, you're going to have, of course, conflicts and wars, uh, and you're going to have, like, you know, 
Um, and this starts out in like basically in city states. Uh, but eventually is going to expand beyond that to where uh, cities conquer other cities and they form these sort of localized kingdoms. And we are going to have some centralized classical empires, but uh, we're eventually going to get back to, at least in Europe, uh, where it's beyond just city-states where, you know, one or a few people control uh, the resources in a city and have their own rules. Uh, they actually extend that to where they are controlling larger amounts, including many other cities. So now we've gotten to uh, not just city-states, but you could say local uh, kingdoms. Right? And uh, in this case, you're going to have perhaps a monarch and then some nobles that, that run these local areas. Uh, but nonetheless, what's going to be argued here is in this previous system, which was much more like a very, very local city-based setup where you had these people that had their uh, own, own uh, um, access to things, uh, within that was the seeds of its own destruction that these groups are going to increasingly absorb the property of other neighboring groups until it gets bigger and bigger. And now we've got local larger kingdoms that are just a bunch of these uh, kind of tied together in, in, in smaller groups. So within this feudal class, uh, you're going to have, of course, the nobility, or you can say the monarchy too, but they're uh, tied together. Nobility slash monarchy, uh, control. And again, the focus here, according to Marx, is going to be control of material wealth uh, uh, or, or, or the means of production or private property uh, specifically. So nobility and monarchy are going to control uh, private property or I should say the means of production. Well, we'll say private property to keep it simple. Control the surplus slash private property. Uh, and they're going to continue uh, a system where, of course, other people are going to be creating the goods for them. Uh, in this case, it's going to be uh, the peasants uh, are going to work for the uh, upper classes. And um, the way that Marx is going to see this as uh, a thesis to antithesis is he's going to believe that this feudal system has within itself its own contradiction, the seeds of its own destruction. Uh, and he believed it would have uh, traditionally been the peasants, but it's actually not going to be purely the peasants, although um, uh, Marx does really like uh, examples of peasant rebellions across time, particularly those ones back we mentioned in period one, those peasant rebellions from 1524 to 26 in the Holy Roman Empire. He was a big fan of those because it was very much peasants rising up in response to mistreatment uh, by the nobility. Uh, and or monarchs, but specifically nobility. Um, so what he's going to see is the seeds of destruction for this, uh, the preceding um, um, form before industrial society, is he sees actually the semi-capitalist uh, uh, groups. And here he means those people that are uh, engaging in light early commercial activity. So merchants, bankers, um, maybe small landowners that are going to eventually start accruing wealth and accruing their own uh, surpluses and private property. And they're going to be the ones that grow uh, and are going to be dissatisfied with this setup and essentially uh, eliminate it in favor of a new one. So these semi-capitalist groups, including bankers, uh, what's the word I'm looking for that I just said? Merchants, um, small landowners, they're the ones that are going to actually, not the peasants, are going to be the ones that sort of start replacing this system. So you can see in each of these um, the seeds of its own undoing being formed uh, by um, uh, the own, their own condition. So it's going to be that here's the idea within it lies a contradiction, which when it uh, arises in the case of semi-capitalist is going to shift the system uh, into a new, more improved version of that. So. Marx thought that this was a historical progression towards um, a version of this again, uh, but a, a one that included uh, technology and prosperity and wealth, but evenly shared. Because in between, we, we did develop new technology, and that's going to carry on, but it's going to create issues of private property and surplus, which are going to be fought for over time. Uh, he does believe, though, that uh, this is going to eventually uh, evolve into a, a, a system where there is no group that has the private property and group that doesn't have it and it works for them. He wants, he thinks the end goal is a society where you do have this affluence and wealth, but no one is going to control it per se. It's going to be 
uh, owned by everybody and, and shared for the most part. All right, so that's the feudal system, so let's go to the next one. I want to focus in on this a bit more. So from that feudal system, and you do have some commercial activity, obviously, as well as some peasant revolts, but uh, as people are displaced from the enclosure movement and commercialization, uh, these peasants are being driven from the land into cities, and they are, are, they are driving this uh, new development, this new technological, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, era, uh, that's going to change the material conditions for 19th century people. And by material conditions, I mean, again, the technology they have and the access they have to food and goods uh, and money. So the era in which Marx resides is going to be, of course, industrial society. And he's going to argue that um, while they may still exist in some forms uh, throughout uh, Europe, that the, uh, the monarchs and the nobles are a, a um, not the classes that are in control uh, like they were before. They may still exist to some extent, but the new class that has um, sort of destroyed the old system, uh, which they certainly were in the process of doing uh, during the French Revolution uh, and the um, developments in England, uh, all those are more peaceful, but certainly the, the English Civil War, Glorious Revolution, and all of the uh, changes that Britain's gonna have with inside of itself uh, that are more private property based, more free trade based, uh, including the United States, uh, and certainly by those revolutions of 1830, 1848, uh, where the feudal system is absolutely in peril and on the verge of destruction by this new middle class. Um, he's going to see that, of course, the new um, controllers of resources are the middle class, which he calls uh, the bourgeoisie. But we're just going to say middle class, and you can just refer to them as middle class. Um, for this uh, ideology, as it's being explained. So, to uh, Marx, this is the class that possesses the property. So they are the owners of private property. And the, the controllers of the means of production. And uh, production has greatly increased at this point uh, because we now have... Um, uh, industrial factories. So this is a, a, a change. So they're going to be using the, uh, the, the seeds of the old the, the destruction of the feudal uh, stage, which were those uh, commercial classes that have grown and gone to replace uh, the uh, increasingly replace the, the power and wealth of the nobility uh, for these middle class folk. But he doesn't argue that it's better yet. It's better in that we have more stuff to go around but it's not gonna be better in that we now have a quality, because we don't. He's gonna argue and, and say that this middle class actually uh, are still much like the uh, masters of the um, uh, Neolithic era that had their, their slaves in, in city-state kingdoms, uh, or the imperial kingdoms that were you know, patrician and plebeian based and slave based uh, of the classical era, and the feudal system that had the nobility and monarchy that were, were lording over literally the peasantry. He's gonna say it's changed forms, uh, and it is different in that the class is less clear because it's not like, oh, I was born in this family, therefore I get to inherit my, my father's or, or mother's kingdom or, or land or whatever. It's not, now you can sort of join this class. It's not clear who they are, but they are definitely uh, distinct in their control uh, and power compared to the other class. And the class he thinks that they are uh, in control of is this working class. Uh, this is what he refers to as the proletariat. I would just say working class, though. And those are the uh, industrial and agricultural, but we're focusing on industrial, industrial workers of factories. So you might be asking yourself, and this is something that Marx points out, so what's wrong with this? Uh, for the first time in history, we've got like more stuff to go around than we need. Um, we're actually outproducing our own, uh, at least within each uh, industrial state, we're actually outproducing our own um, uh, needs of our citizens. Like, there's almost not enough to go around in some cases. Things are actually spoiling now. Uh, before, it was always trying to keep up with um, the, um, the, the goings on of nature and, and famines and droughts and pestilence and more. But uh, for the most part, generally speaking, starting the Industrial Revolution, that becomes less of an issue to the point that 
we actually have surpluses now. So why aren't people happy? He's gonna say because there's no equality yet. Uh, society at this point is uh, still, in fact increasingly, still unequal uh, because of private property. Uh, because the middle class owns production uh, and property. The middle class doesn't. And you can look at many examples uh, in uh, England uh, or any state in the 19th century. The working class often owned no property. They would either live uh, in company towns, tenement houses, um, and they did not <clears throat> have their own things, their own material wealth. Uh, they were dependent on this middle class for jobs. So he's going to argue the working class had no property, or very little at the very least, uh, and was was dependent on the middle class for survival. So how does this middle class survive? Well, they basically sell themselves into slavery as um, uh, Marx and Engels sort of uh, uh, describe it. Uh, in their case, they're gonna um, have to, the working class is forced to, forced to sell their labor for wages. Uh, and they do eventually get the term uh, wage slaves. So he's gonna say, all right, we might have more stuff to go around, but um, people aren't any happier because they are still slaves, but now they're wage slaves rather than class slaves, uh, you know, like rigidly, uh, legally peasants. Because back in the feudal era and all the eras before, if you were a slave or a peasant and you disobeyed your lord or your master, like you could be punished or killed for that. They were like rules. The, the, uh, the, the system and rules that had developed out of the material circumstances at that time, as, as the historical materialist interpretation would say, uh, made those rules to maintain that system. But as those systems were destroyed internally, uh, they would make uh, new sets of rules. <coughs> so the rules here are uh, not that you are limited based on your birth, potentially, or, 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 or specifically, uh, but uh, you are still controlled by others who control uh, private property uh, in the form of, in this case, profit. Uh, and they're going to have to uh, act as slaves uh, because they have no choice. They have to go work for these people who own all the, uh, all of the goods uh, and means of production and sell their uh, labor as slaves. Uh, so it's important to note a major mistake that most classical Marxists, including Marx and Engels themselves, make at this point. They believe that um, the economy is a zero-sum game. Um, so there's actually two things they believe here, but before I, I, I go into it, uh, let me uh, continue here <clears throat> with this. So they've got to sell their wages, uh, sell their labor for wages, and Marx really does not like this because he believes that human beings actually enjoy work um, but not when they're forced to work and not when they can't keep their own, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, works or production uh, or, 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 or end products, I guess you could say. Uh, so he was, uh, Marx was, Marx believed uh, in work, but uh, work by choice. So do the projects you want to do and you get to keep uh, your own works and you can sell them if you want. Uh, or, or not, or trade them. Work by choice and uh, ownership. So he was absolutely in favor of production and technology and factories and all that, but he didn't like the idea that the people going in to make the stuff had to make something um, that uh, somebody else determined or forced them to, um, forced by necessity, I guess you could say, because wage slaves choose to be wage slaves, but he's, he suggests that they don't have any alternatives. They have to do this. Uh, and therefore they're going to be unhappy uh, because they are selling their labor so they don't get to keep their products uh, and they can't actually make it their own. Uh, they're forced to make uh, what the factory owner wants uh, and they aren't able to keep it uh, and they are paid a minimal amount. So actually uh, Marx saw this as um, uh, labor theft or I guess say product theft. theft. So he was very much opposed to this system. Um, so uh, what he is going to suggest Actually, hold on, am I done explaining that? Sell for wages. They don't get a choice in ownership. Oh, and furthermore, he's going to believe that uh, the working class is going to be so unhappy at one point that they're going to be forced to change the system. Uh, and this is where Marx uh, makes his error. Um, so he, he was wonderful, does a wonderful job of describing some of the problems 
that exist, because certainly to some degree, at least some of these problems exist back then. You definitely have under, unpaid, unhappy people that are uh, being exploited uh, with a lack of, of protection by the state um, or, or material wealth around in choice. But he's incorrect um, in one major way that, you know, to be fair to him, he would have no way, no way of knowing this. Um, <clears throat> Marx's main flaw here is going to be uh, that uh, the free market system is not a, what's called a zero sum game. A zero sum game means that there's a fixed amount of, of money or materials in the world. It's kind of like a mercantilist theory. Uh, and so the goal is if I get more materials or, or profit in, in this case, because that's what they're, they're selling, right? They're selling this for wages and the middle class uh, factory owners are selling the products for money, profit. Um, so whether it's profit or whether it's material goods, uh, and those of course are both used to, to, uh, to acquire one another, but whether it's uh, uh, money or it's material goods, uh, a zero sum game would mean there's a fixed amount in the world. So if I get some, like if I get profit or materials, it's not that um, I've created it for myself, I've actually taken it from somebody else, right? That goes back to the old mercantilist fixed wealth system of, oh, selling to another country is good, but buying from another country is bad, because if we sell, we get the money, and they lose it. Uh, and if we buy, they get the money, and we lose it. So that's why they made these big tariff systems and uh, formed these colonies and tried to take other colonies and steal the trade and goods of other rival states, because they believe that there's only a certain amount, and the more I have, the less you have, and therefore it's better. It actually turns out, and again, Marx could not have known this in the 19th century, the free market system, uh, when it's tied to the banking and financial system, especially in the 20th century uh, and 21st century with our, our, our monetary policies and fiscal policies, you can actually create wealth. Like, the working class would, over time, lose all of their money and have nothing and be forced to uh, fight against the middle class if it was a zero-sum game. The only problem is, uh, well, it's not a problem, it's actually a good thing, but the problem for this theory is it's not a zero-sum game. You can create wealth um, through uh, monetary policies, fiscal policies, uh, job creation, um, uh, lending and borrowing, investing. You can actually create wealth. So it's not that there's only certain amount out there, so if I get enough, you have none. Uh, it's actually that I can get more and you can get more uh, because it's actually a wealth creation system. It's certainly not perfect and it's certainly taken us decades and decades and decades to improve, and it's by no means perfect, but nonetheless we have found out um, pretty conclusively that the free market system, with of course uh, uh, mixed um, uh, state intervention and regulation, is a decent system for creating wealth. Uh, so he uh, unfortunately believed that it was. So the free market system is not a zero-sum game. Uh, it actually can create wealth, can create wealth. All right, so knowing that, let's talk about what he thought would go wrong. Uh, what he thought would go wrong, because again, he, he was not aware of this uh, phenomena or development or characteristic of the free market capitalist system. Um, and by the way, that doesn't mean that many of his uh, criticisms weren't also valid, but uh, this is a big thing to be wrong about. So he believed that over time, the middle class uh, would um, absorb more and more and more of the resources and money in the world. So what they would do is they would uh, invent better machines or buy better machinery. So middle class would um, cut wages and jobs over time uh, to eliminate labor costs. That would mean that these working class people are either being paid less or they lose their jobs. So as they lose money and they lose their jobs over time, the middle class uh, grows wealthier and wealthier, the working class grows poorer and poorer, and eventually, eventually, uh, the working class would become, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Deprived uh, to the point of rebellion or revolt. So he believed that over time this working class would have either replaced by machines as technology improved or the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The middle class factory owners would, would cut their wages and continually uh, and lay people off uh, to acquire more, more profits for themselves. And in fact, actually, he believed the middle class would eat itself too. He believed that these competing factories 
uh, would uh, you'd increasingly have winners and losers so that the uh, factory that went out of business would join the working class uh, and then of course eventually uh, work themselves down to the point that they're not making any money or at least not enough money uh, to purchase anything to survive. Um, so eventually the working class become deprived of the point of rebellion uh, due to a lack of uh, money, wages, because they don't own the private property uh, and all the profits are going to uh, the owners of those, those uh, factories, not the working class. And again, over time, you believed through competition, middle class people would be ejected into the working class, and over time, machinery and uh, cut wages because there's no competitors uh, would reduce the working class uh, to nothing. So what this is all kind of referring to, and even his materialistic, uh, or dialectic materialism view of, of uh, history going in stages that uh, create the conditions for uh, the next stage. Uh, that's going to be sort of what we call or refer to now, at least in sociology, as, as uh, conflict theory. Conflict theory. So this is definitely a materialist um, viewpoint, uh, and it's very, very popular in sociology. Uh, and what they've done is um, they initially adopted this view from Marx, but they've adjusted it because we found out again that uh, the working class, middle class competition and, 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 uh, uh, and race for resources and existence uh, didn't actually play out because it turns out that both over time get wealthy. So not only did the rich middle class grow, but also the, the intermittent middle class that wasn't super wealthy, but you know, um, increasingly wealthy grew. And the working class did decrease instead of decrease, instead of there being more uh, helpless, poor uh, physical workers. Yes, automation and ma machines did replace some of them, but uh, they actually were increasingly able to move up to the, uh, the interim middle class, the, the, the semi-wealthy or, or average income middle class, instead of being stuck down in the uh, labor-intensive, low-pay uh, factory jobs uh, over time. Uh, but again, they didn't know that. But conflict theory is the idea that um, society should be viewed through the lens of uh, viewed as a, uh, a, a series of conflicts uh, over uh, material wealth uh, or uh, power. And what it does is it studies how these uh, economic or social systems are formed based on this knowledge that there's one class that has more power or influence than the other, and they're going to try to set up a society that continues uh, and maintains their power over others. So they're initially gonna start off with a class-based view, but by the mid 20th century, this becomes clear um, with the fail of national socialist regimes, as well as uh, the uh, Marxist re socialist regimes. Uh, as they fail into the, into the mid 20th century, they start abandoning this class-based um, view because obviously the working class doesn't just uh, uh, devolve into um, uh, depravity and, and then of course, uh, violent revolution they actually end up joining the middle class, um, they switched it. They switched from a class-based view to uh, other uh, groups. They based it instead on gender or, or ethnic minorities uh, or able-bodiedness um, and other factors. Um, but that's what conflict theory and sociology are dependent on, is this idea that society uh, isn't genuine and based on human nature, uh, that in fact human nature uh, um, is unlike what society describes it as. It's based actually on these competing groups who um, have different levels of power, and the, the more powerful group, of course, is trying to maintain that, so they'll make views and laws and, and, and beliefs that uh, enforce that structure and try to keep the other group from becoming uh, equally powerful or more powerful. That's essentially what conflict theory is, uh, and it's splintered off into uh, uh, different focuses of groups. But initially, uh, and Marx is sort of the um, inceptor of this, this way of looking at the world, um, it's going to be class-based. So that's what his basic set of ideas states. It's that history is a, uh, um, should be viewed uh, materialistically as these, um, as predicated on the um, availability of material wealth uh, and that ideas in society are based on those circumstances, but also within each stage uh, contains its own contradiction. Uh, its own demise that will rise up, uh, uh, counter it, and usher in a new th synthesized version of that, uh, whether you're starting at the comic, primitive communist stage, or the master and slave stage, or the patrician plebeian stage of classical empires, or the feudal stage of the medieval era, 
uh, or the uh, industrial stage here. So that's where Marx believes that they are, and this is what Marx believes will drive the end of that, um, uh, this stage of industrial society. Uh, and again, uh, the information is a bit incomplete, and by the mid 20th century, they figure out that his predictions are incorrect. But uh, let's go into what he sees as the next stage. Because again, he sees not these stages aren't uh, not as incorrect or incomplete or wrong, but as continuations or closer approximations of what the true ideal uh, is, what a true scenario is where everyone has equal access to things, relatively speaking, uh, and that there is no uh, forced hierarchy of, of one class controlling another class being exploited. Uh, that's his ultimate goal. So he sees this as a, the next step towards uh, what he sees as the uh, socialist phase, or, or say, actually communist phase. So this uh, class struggle over private property that has historically been developing, uh, he believes is going to ultimately lead to the next stage. So as I mentioned before, he believed that eventually the working class, the proletariat, would grow because middle class people would lose uh, the, the factory competition to others, fall into the working class, and then mechanization and cut wages would drive this increasingly large and poor working class to the point that they, just to survive, they would have to uh, remove or change the system uh, by necessity. So to Marx, the antithesis or the contradiction was the proletariat, the working class, that's going to grow and eventually uh, cause this industrial society to, uh, to, to contradict itself and, and form a new uh, synthesis or new society. So he believed it would progress like this. Uh, as the uh, working class would grow, so this is kind of like I say the first stage, as the uh, uh, working class would grow, this, again, the stage is like a two-step or two-stage uh, program, was well, kind of three, uh, to uh, this ideal society. Um, first, of course, this depraved working class would uh, grow in size and decrease in uh, I guess you say power, but material uh, wealth or power. Uh, and eventually get to a critical point where people were too depraved, too uh, upset, too resentful, and they would actually lash out. Uh, and um, initially he talks about a violent revolution, but as time went on into the late 19th century, he sort of revised it uh, in one of his editions of, of, of Capital. Uh, where he says, suggests that it can come uh, non-violently uh, through progressive uh, reforms like he saw happening in England and the, the seeds of that happening in Germany as well under uh, Bismarck. So, um, and also Napoleon III too in France. So he uh, believed it would grow in size and decrease in material wealth and power. Initially he does uh, fairly overtly say that could come in the form of a violent, uh, violent proletariat revolution. But he does um, uh, edit or revise and say it could um, be uh, uh, nonviolent uh, democratic process. And again, he sees that happening in uh, not so much in France and Germany. That's going to be more of an autocratic reform system under new conservatives like Napoleon III and, and Bismarck. But certainly in England, it comes democratically um, after. Ironically, uh, John Stuart Mill's and, and very classical liberal enlightenment policies of uh, expanding suffrage and allowing reforms and working class voting uh, to, to change things. So uh, whether it's violent or not, um, he believes the proletariat will rise up and seize the means of production uh, from the, work, the middle class. Seize means of production uh, from the middle class. So the middle class would cease to exist uh, because the material wealth would be seized from them, the private property uh, would be seized by the proletariat, uh, and they would um, control the means of production themselves. The middle class would either uh, peacefully be absorbed or uh, perhaps violently uh, destroyed or, or exiled or eliminated. All right, so that would lead to uh, stage two, <clears throat> and this is kind of a, this is actually kind of a two and three, but we'll just, we'll just call it two. Um, it would initially start out as a, uh, a, a state-run uh, socialist uh, system. And you, you might say, well, who's the state? Who's the government? Uh, run by the, uh, the working class, uh, with the working class uh, functioning as a whole, somehow, 
functioning as the, um, how can I phrase this, the, uh, the state. Uh, so he realized that, of course, this is first going to have to happen in each industrial economy. So like uh, I know most uh, Marxists believe this would first happen in Germany. Um, they were kind of, by the late 19th century, aware that it wasn't going to happen, at least violently, in England uh, and Great Britain. But it could certainly happen in Germany, which is where they most of them thought it would, and um, France, which were very counter-enlightenment uh, um, driven, I guess counter-enlightenment driven um, states or societies or cultures. All right. Uh, of course, Germany's going to go the National Socialist route, um, unfortunately for them and all the people in it. Uh, when Hitler comes around, and France is going to go, not entirely, but more so the um, uh, Marxist socialist route. But not, I'm not saying they became communist because they don't, uh, but they don't really endorse the national socialist perspective. They diff still stay democratic, but they tend to favor more left-leaning than, than right-leaning policies as far as the uh, uh, socialist theories go. So state-run socialist system, uh, and at this point, uh, the proletariat government uh, functions as a what's called the dictatorship of the proletariat. But Marx didn't envision, uh, by the way, this government being like you know a few people that decide what to do for the proletariat. Uh, he sort of envisioned it as, how can I phrase this, uh, the whole proletariat class functioning as the government, uh, certainly locally, and that becomes the uh, overall goal. Dictator proletariat um, is going to control uh, property or the means of production uh, and eliminate private property uh, in favor of equal profit sharing uh, and a, uh, a high income tax. So they use that high income tax to provide for the, um, uh, you know, infrastructure and, and distribution and well-being and maybe even military, uh, but certainly not military in the long run. But uh, that the, the state things would be paid for and distributed by uh, this proletariat working class uh, government, and they would uh, do that equally uh, and function as a collective. And again, the focus here is you can still be an individual and do your own thing, but um, uh, you're more concerned about the well-being of others. So it was uh, predicated largely on um, uh, cooperation. And that would eventually, as more and more states converted to this, this format, you would eventually enter what's, what's referred to as uh, the, the communal or communist state, uh, which would be uh, look something like this. Uh, it would be largely a, a stateless, certainly a national, nation stateless, stateless, uh, borderless, uh, global set, of uh, local cooperative, I guess you could say federations. That's more of the anarchy way of describing it, but uh, groups. Um, so people would live in these uh, localized, decentralized communities, uh, utilizing factories and, and, and producing goods, uh, and they would make decisions collectively. So the workers at a factory would decide what they made and how much they made it. Not like one person. Uh, as part of a, a for, an enforced hierarchy, like you're the boss and you decide and you can fire people if you want. It'd be a collective thing. Uh, maybe they do choose one person to decide, but that person would reflect their wishes and not be like technically in control of other people. Um, so that would be um, workers run slash determine uh, output and production, as well as um, and share profits. So uh, it's not that the factory is owned by somebody, the factory is owned by the workers who are doing the work. And that's ultimately what Marx saw as the, the ideal way of living. So that you weren't working for somebody else, uh, you were working for yourself or with others cooperatively, uh, and you got to do what you would want to do. So it didn't mean that you were even stuck doing one job. Uh, you could do different jobs, potentially, if you wanted to. Uh, I think he talks about, too, like somebody being a hunter one day and a fisher the other day, and, you know doing what they want to do as the day progresses, debating later on and, and doing whatever they want to do. You, you sort of have that freedom. So it's still individualistic in that you get to do what you want. Um, it's not like a very strict Rousseauian, here's the super organism and if you're in the way of it, you aren't an individual, get out of the way or, or die. Um, but it is based on uh, communal cooperation, uh, communal cooperation. 
And Marx believed that this next phase, this, this next form uh, from which the uh, thesis and antithesis of, of capitalist industrial society contradicts itself and forms the new synthesis, that this would be the synthesis. And it actually would uh, uh, be happier and more productive than capitalist uh, societies, the one that preceded it. So it would be uh, largely classless as well, because there is no uh, property-owning class. There is only the, uh, the collective of, of, of workers that jointly share in profits based on, um, I believe they based it on, you would get pay. Uh, anarchists also shared this um, uh, largely, at least classical anarchists did, uh, that you would be paid, not in the form of money, but in some sort of like worker or labor note, uh, and that you would be paid based on the time you put in uh, and the difficulty of the actual job. So just because you swept the room uh, doesn't mean you deserve the same amount in an hour. So you swept the factory in an hour doesn't mean you deserve the same amount as somebody who fixed or repaired a complicated piece of machinery for an hour. You would have a difference in pay, uh, but that would be some agreed upon uh, settled um, uh, wage that's chosen by uh, all of the factories together collectively. So classless, um, uh, economic and social system of cooperation. All right, and that's essentially what uh, the Marxist theory believed. And again, just to recap real quickly, he saw history um, in a dialectical manner of um, uh, conflicting viewpoints of like, you know, here's an idea, here's a contradiction, uh, and that those two combined uh, and in themselves the entire time had the existence of the next new uh, synthesized idea or society. So historically he saw that as primitive communism, then the invention of technology brought a surplus, which also uh, shifted um, uh, and, and, and proposed private property. Uh, and then of course, some people acquired that property and controlled the others and exploited them to reduce it. Uh, and then that of course led to the classical and then the feudal and then the capitalist societies, which in each of them contained the uh, contradiction that led to the next stage. Um, so that neither stage was correct or entirely wrong, but it was a necessary process that would lead to this uh, communist or socialist stage where um, individual ownership is going to be rejected uh, because, again, in the capitalist society, even though there was more to go around, uh, according to Marx, less and less people would, would, would benefit from that. More and more people would fall into the depraved category uh, and fall out of the increasingly powerful uh, middle class that controlled the uh, property. So these working class people uh, who are forced to function as wage slaves who don't own their own labor or determine it, uh, as they be become more and more impoverished, they eventually rise up, uh, be it uh, via for violent revolution or through uh, peaceful means to eliminate the middle class or absorb them, uh, and then take their private property and collectively share it uh, and run it together in the form of a, a, uh, a socialist state that would eventually, over time, evolve into a, a, a stateless global society that functioned in individual communes where uh, workers uh, would, would collectively run and decide and profit from their own work uh, based on their own, their own choices. Uh, so that was the prevailing theory, and it became increasingly popular as the 19th century went on and into the 20th century. Um, so what I want to talk about real quick, not too long, but you, you do deserve to know this, uh, why this didn't work out. And I've already mentioned one thing. So one of the biggest errors, and again, no fault of Marx for not knowing this, nobody else knew this at the time either, it's not a zero-sum game, unfortunately for Marx. Um, so why was it a disaster? Because it was. Communism killed by far the most people, uh, or at least of its own people, uh, during the 20th century, far more than the, uh, the uh, also equally evil and worthy of criticizing uh, and condemning National Socialists, but uh, why was it a disaster? So first of all, uh, Marx is incorrect that, um, uh, incorrect about um, the zero-sum game of market economies. It turns out, as um, the data has clearly indicated, that the working class doesn't get poorer and the middle class doesn't just get richer and smaller. Uh, both actually grow and the working class gets smaller uh, and increasingly wealthier versions of the middle class 
across the spectrum actually accrue wealth as time goes on. And that includes real wages, and that certainly includes living standards. Uh, because of this industrial production um, and private ownership, people invent new things that make life easier than it was before for the same amount of money. So like, for example, I've mentioned this before, uh, 100 years ago, to be uh, a poor person is, was much worse off than a poor person now, because even poor people now uh, in, in Western uh, in developed nations still have access to uh, commodities. Uh, the problem now isn't a lack of things, scarcity, it's actually largely a surplus. That's why we're dealing with um, weight issues and, and, and health issues related with that. Um, and uh, we have access to um, technologies that are just like running water, electricity, warmth, food. Those are all available uh, in uh, certainly Western uh, states with social safety, social safety nets. Uh, that's a much different scenario than 100 years ago uh, for somebody who was uh, of the same degree of poverty. So uh, they're incorrect about the zero-sum game. Uh, they're also incorrect about, um, about living standards for the reason I just mentioned. Because what it means to be poor now is certainly different than it was 100 years ago as far as what you have access to, even if you are equally poor relative to the rest of the population. Um, they're also incorrect about um, the working class revolutionaries. Uh, perhaps the working class revolution, be it violent or peaceful, would have occurred. Um, well, it actually did, technically, in, in the Soviet Union and in China. So it did actually occur, but un under different circumstances. Um, these working class revolutions that weren't like led by anybody in particular, but as a whole for these uh, working class groups, they didn't occur because of these two factors. Um, you don't revolt against a system in which you think you can improve your situation. Uh, or you actually can in most cases. Uh, and of course, if you are born into a situation where uh, maybe, you know, especially in the early 20th century, and we still had, like in the US, for example, um, um, segregation in the South, it was definitely harder to be born into a poor minority group, absolutely. Uh, but it was still, unlike other points in history, possible uh, to um, better improve your scenario with, through a combination of your own ability and work ethic and, and luck as well. Um, and there are certain social mechanisms that made it more difficult for others, but it was possible. In the past, uh, throughout human history, it wasn't impossible, or it wasn't possible to move up because you had specific class limitations. Um, but, so, uh, working class is not likely to revolt if their situation is getting better, uh, which has been the case uh, since the 19th century. Certainly in the United States uh, and in England, the uh, uh, liberal democracies have progressively expanded freedom rightfully so, uh, and have also increasingly become wealthy um, across the spectrum of, uh, of, of economic wealth. Um, another reason why it's going to be incorrect is, well, I'm not going to say incorrect, because we're talking why it's a disaster. Another reason why it's a disaster is um, uh, impatience of anti-capitalist intellectuals. Uh, what's going to happen here is, um, in many cases, like for example, by the theories of, of, of Lenin and Mao, uh, in, in Lenin in Russia, which is the Soviet Union, and Stalin, his predecessor, uh, or successor, and then uh, Mao in China, they're going to attempt to uh, basically say, well, we can't wait for the working class to rise up because um, depending on the intellectual, specifically, they might think that the proletariat are too uh, stupid to realize the solution. They're like, they might realize they have a problem, but that we're gonna be the ones, us smart folk, are going to be the ones that show them, uh, tell them what to do, show them what the right path is and, and the right remedy is. So uh, the uh, impatience of anti-capitalist intellectuals uh, resulted in, in elite vanguard uh, movements. And this was uh, part of uh, Leninist Marxism or, or Maoist Marxism, where basically they grew impatient and said, well, the working class is going to do it by themselves, so I'm going to have to, along with my uh, officials, and of course Stalin's also going to be an adherent to this, I have to do it. Uh, I have to tell them what they need and, and make the system for them. And if anybody gets in my way, out they go. Just drop my marker. Out they go, right? Kind of that Rousseauian superorganism uh, view where if anything's in the way of the collective, it's an enemy and therefore it needs to be eradicated. Uh, so that's why in so many of these communist states, um, when the, the vanguard would take control, it was Lenin and Stalin or, or later Mao, um, even though they had some nuances into how they implemented it, like the Soviets were more industrial focused and the, the, the Maoists under China, uh, or the China under Mao was more agrarian focused, um, they would go, they would 
use any means to achieve that. So again, if you oppose them or criticize them, uh, you were gone. Uh, either killed, imprisoned, sent off to work camp, whatever it might be. And uh, the methods they employed were unfortunately um, ineffective. Uh, it, it turns out that you can't just have people uh, work either collectively or have them decide locally, because they tried that initially in the Soviet Union, but then Lenin uh, sort of took the reins from these uh, local uh, worker federations uh, and Soviets. Uh, it, it doesn't produce enough. Um, it, it's not, for whatever reason, because whether it's not, because it's not organized or it's not centralized or it's not driven, or maybe, it's, maybe we need the hierarchies, we're not exactly sure. Um, but it didn't work out as planned, and so what would happen would be these regimes, whether it was Lenin or Stalin or, or Mao, would sort of uh, put, push their thumb down, push their thumbs down and, and, and look for explanations as to why it didn't work and think that it was because of saboteurs or uh, capitalists in secret or critici uh, criticizers, uh, and they would go through for another wave of, 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 of murders and imprisonments because they thought somebody was sabotaging the system. Uh, and that's the basic formula for every communist state in the 20th century. Something like that would occur. They would take over they, as the no better elite vanguard. They would take over, remove any obstacle or anyone they deemed as an obstacle, even if they weren't, uh, and then brutally murder them. Uh, the outcome was not as productive as they intended. Millions would die from famine. They'd usually go for a third round of, 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 um, of what's the word I'm looking for? Looking for saboteurs to improve the system. Uh, and then usually the regime would collapse shortly after that, um, or they'd have to switch. Um, the USSR collapsed, uh, even as they got, well actually I should say this, the USSR tried to adopt more Western policies before they collapsed, uh, and things were improving. Uh, China absolutely developed uh, Western economic practices, but still maintained its elite one-party state. Uh, and also, um, well, any example you pick, uh, it started something similar to that, uh, where uh, classical Marxists would look to the, the Soviet Union, and oh, they found out in the 1950s how terrible things were, like, oh, never mind, how about Mao? And they found out in the 1960s how terrible things were under Mao. Then you would look to Vietnam, uh, and then to uh, Cuba, uh, and then to whoever they would look to, but it all ended the same. Uh, so some people do criticize this approach as the reason why it doesn't work. Some uh, favor the more classical uh, uh, Marxist approach that it should be a collective effort by the proletariat, um, but they, they do get impatient. And I think, uh, I forget her first name, um, uh, but, but Luxembourg, what's the first name? There's an intellectual with the last name of Luxembourg uh, who also believed that this was the incorrect approach and it should be a more uh, class-based collective approach. But unfortunately, for that theory, it doesn't occur because, in, in almost all scenarios, because situations get better over time under uh, classical uh, liberal, or I should say free market economies. Um, and of course, over time, they also get more regulated, which makes people uh, happier uh, and more feel more protected and safe with a, with a social safety net to sort of uh, capture them. So that's Marxism. Uh, that's largely the reasons why it failed. Um, if you want to look into leftist ideology more and uh, figure out why uh, maybe these are, aren't the correct explanations or what can be done about it. I, I encourage you to do it, absolutely. Uh, but uh, do know that this is largely why Marxism, uh, as it was known, splintered and ended by the 1950s and 60s and has shifted since into being uh, anti-capitalist in the other direction. So it was anti-capitalist in that they thought that capitalism would eventually not provide enough. But now that capitalism provides more than enough, they've shifted their approach to being not based on class, because the working class um, has, um, for the most part, improved their lot and are no longer concerned with, with, with revolution. But they've also focused on, instead of appreciating the availability of, of resources and materials from free market systems to becoming anti-materialist, because if capitalism uh, brings with it material success, then therefore the material success and, and quest for profit is evil, and so that should be opposed. Uh, and they also look at some of the environmental damage that's come along with capitalism and, and condemn it for that. And that one perhaps rightfully so, but also um, most capitalist nations uh, do eventually adopt more pro-environmental policies. So it's a pretty complicated mess, but that's, um, uh, that's what 19th century Marxism uh, was and it developed into and uh, splintered into following the uh, mid 20th century.